I've experienced a number of storms in life, and one of them was so bad that I had to sit down on the floor to pack my bags to disembark the next day. And another storm, I stood up to preach, and uh, the boat began to rock so much that I, I couldn't stand up and preach, so we had to call it off. And then a third one really got rough, and um, I was looking around for my life vest just in case I might possibly need it. Then I think about one other storm when I was sailing, and I thought I knew a little bit more about it than I did, and a squall came up and caught me, and before I could get the sail down, I capsized, and I'm out in the water, and another boat picks me up. So I've had a few storms in life. But the worst storms in my life have not been on the sea. When I came to First Baptist Church, I came as an associate pastor, and when the church decided they wanted me to be the pastor, some folks decided they didn't, and so that was a storm in my life. And then when I was president of the Southern Baptist Convention for a couple of years, that first year that I presided over the convention of 50-some thousand messengers, which was a very, very difficult time, that was a storm in my life. And then I think about one of the worst storms was watching my mother die a day at a time for about three months. That was a stormy time. The worst storm of all lasted the longest. It hurt me the most, tested my faith, tested my endurance, and I would have to say it was the worst storm of my life. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. How do you ride out the storms in your life? Because we all have them. Some of us have a little more difficult storms than others, but we all have storms. How do you ride them out? Do you want to give up and quit and just walk away, or do you have to fight to endure them? How do you respond? Well, what I want to talk about in this message is this, and that is, our anchor in the times of storm. Listen to this verse of Scripture. The Scripture says, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. The Bible says that His Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It is certainly an anchor in our time of storms. And in the Mediterranean world, the anchor was a very familiar term. On the cat, in the catacombs where the Christians would meet secretly, there are 66 pictures of anchors. And in a picture, for example, there's a ship, you can tell the wind's blowing against it and uh, the ship is uh, in trouble, but it's anchored to something solid. It's immovable. God has given us an anchor for the times of storm in our life. So how do you ride them out in your life? Do you just complain and moan and groan and ask God why, or do you ride them out? And find out what God will do in your life when you ride them out. Well, I want to give you a number of uh, pointers about uh, storms, and I want you to think about the kind of storms that you've been through in life. And as I say, we've, we've all been through them. And so, uh, what we need to do is to ask ourselves the question, how do we handle these storms when they come? Because when you think about an anchor, for example, an anchor is a symbol of stability and security. And every ship carries one or more anchors. What is the anchor in the life of the believer? The anchor in the life of the believer is the Word of God. In a few moments, I want to be able to help you understand what the Bible really is. It's not just a book. What is the Bible to begin with? What is this anchor? And how does this anchor help you and me walk through the storms in life that we have to walk through? Now, they come in different forms, and they come in different seasons of life. For example, many people today are walking through the storm of financial trouble and heartache. They've lost their home, they lost their job, and they, it's a storm in their life. Many other people are going through the storm of ill health. And we talk about all these things today about health and so forth. Many people are living in a storm of health. For somebody else, it's in their family, separation, divorce, stormy time in their life, loss of job, broken relationships, all kinds of storms come, and they come in different seasons in life. 
And they come in ways oftentimes. For example, there are storms that people experience, they don't tell anybody. It's not so much that it's a secret storm as it is that some storms you just don't talk about. And people face those storms, and they face them uh, privately and quietly uh, without telling anybody. And yet what happens is they're still suffering, whether you tell anybody or not. Some storms last for a brief moment. Some storms just go on and on and on. And the question is, how do you respond? How do you ride through storms in life? And the reason you and I need to know is for the simple reason, because they, they, they're going to keep coming. There's not going to be a time in your life when you say, well, whew, no more storms in my life. About that time you get hit with some blindsided something in your life. Because that's just the way life is. We, we live in a fallen world, and that's the way it is. So the question comes, uh, what's the origin of these storms? Where do they come from? So they come from one of several places. For example, some storms we create ourselves, something we do in our life. Some storms, for example, the result of something someone else does to us. Sometimes it's a matter of Satan doing something in a person's life, just, just the pure devil working in a person's life. And then sometimes, of course, God is the one who is responsible for the storm. You say, well, why would God send a storm in someone's life? Isn't He a God of love? Yes, He is. But the reason I want to bring that up is because He is the author of it. Read the Word of God. Sometimes He is. And so there's always a purpose. That is, if God ignites a storm in your life, He has a definite purpose in mind. So, what's God's purpose? That is, if He allows a storm in your life, and remember, He can send it or He can allow it, and because you're one of His children, nothing can touch you apart from His permissive will. So, if He allows a storm in your life, and some storms come very early in our lives, and I can think about a few that came early in my life just like you can. But What's his purpose? What does he have in mind? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is he wants to get our attention. That is, everything can be going along fine. Let's say that you are a Christian and you're just sort of drifting along and everything's fine. God has a purpose for your life. And so, what does he do? He just either sends a storm or allows a storm in your life to get your attention because what gets our attention is heartache troubles, trials, difficulty, persecution, you name it. He's got our attention. So that's one of the reasons He allows it, to get our attention. A second reason is because He wants to get to some sin in our life, something you've allowed to develop in your life. You know it doesn't belong there. You know it's not pleasing to God. You know it doesn't fit who you are. And so what happens? He sends a storm to get your attention, to get you to listen, to look, and to look at your life and to recognize uh, there's something going on in your life that shouldn't be there. And He wants you to deal with it. And listen to this, the longer you hold on to what He wants to get rid of, the stronger the storm is going to become. And many people, it may begin with a little wind. And for many other people, it ends up to a hurricane for the simple reason they refused to acknowledge that God is up to something in their life. And then, of course, a, a third reason, and that is, he wants you to surrender something. He wants you to lay down something. He wants you to take your hand off of something that you're gripping, that you're grasping very tightly. And God wants you to loosen your grip on it. So, listen, because He's got something better for you than that. And so what happens? He sends a storm to get you to think in Him and to recognize, to get your attention, to look at some sin, and to recognize that you're holding on to something He doesn't want you to hold on to. And all of us have been there. So, you know, you can sit here and think, well, that doesn't really apply to me. Yes, it does. We've all been there. There's another reason, and that is He wants us to conform us to His image. He says, stop being conformed to the likeness of the world, and be ye transformed by the renewing of your heart, that you may prove what is the good and perfect will of God. That is, God's ultimate goal is to shape us into the likeness of His Son. So, what does He do? He gets our attention. He deals with sin. He brings us to surrender. He wants to conform us to His likeness. Because, you see, another reason is He has a purpose. That is, He wants to equip us to serve Him. So, you ask yourself the question, what storm are you going through in life? What is it that's giving you a real difficult time right now? What is it that you'd like to change if you could? 
What is it that is bringing you pain, heartache, and suffering, and disappointment, and oftentimes maybe anger? Maybe you're angry at God about something He's allowed in your life. Then ask yourself the question, God, if, if, if these are the purposes, uh, are, you, are you trying to get my attention? God, you've got it. Is there sin in my life? Show me exactly what it is. Usually we don't have to ask Him to show us. We usually know what that is. What is it you want me to surrender? Shaped in, in the army. What do you need to change in my life? God, are you trying to equip me to serve you? And you see, one of the reasons that some people aren't serving God is because they're not equipped, because they've never reached that stage of surrendering themselves to Him so He can prepare them to serve Him. Somebody says, I could never serve God. You can as long as you have that attitude. And secondly, as long as you're unwilling to, to say, God, whatever you want in my life, open hands, I'm available, I'm willing for you to do whatever you want to do, Lord, here's my life. Then you may be absolutely, totally surprised at what God will do in your life. So, there's always a reason for it, whether He sends it or whether He doesn't. And then some storms come and they affect people in different ways. Now, watch this. A storm in your life can destroy you, or it can develop you. It can build your strength, your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding, your commitment, your devotion, your faith, your serenity, your peace, your joy in your life. That is, some storms, when God gets through working them into our life, we're just so much better off. We are cleaner, we are purer, there's more peace, there's more joy, because you know you're in the center of the will of God. So, sometimes they develop us, sometimes they destroy us. And that depends upon how you respond. So, when storms come, what do you do? You fight against God, you argue with Him, well, Lord, I didn't ask for this, I don't deserve this, what's this all about? You pray for your friends to bail you out of that storm quickly as possible. And isn't it interesting how God, we can just pray, now, Lord, get me out of this as quickly as possible. I don't deserve this. And you know what? <laughs> he must just hum away while we're down here struggling when He wants us just to get our attention because He's got something in mind. He doesn't want a storm to destroy us. And the truth is only when we allow Satan to get a grip on us in the times of difficulty will it happen. But we have to insist on looking at it our way and bailing ourselves out as quickly as possible, He's not going to let it happen. It can destroy us, it can develop us. That is, a storm can put you on the shelf so that you never used of God, or it can equip you to be a fantastic servant of God. It's our response. And our response is determined by a number of things, one of which is our view of God. How, how do you see God? If I see God as this legalistic, strict God who's just chalking off my bad points, or do I see Him as a God of love, and compassion, and kindness, and forgiveness, and purpose, and desire to use you in some fashion, some way? How do you see Him? How do you, how do you picture God? That is, when you think about God, and you're a child of His, and you've been saved, how do you picture Him? Is he, in other words, is He on your side? Or is he on the side of something else? Do you see him behind these storms with anger? Or do you see him an awesome, loving God sending into your life something that you don't like? He knows you don't like it, but he knows it's best for your life at this moment in time. How do you see him? So, if somebody said to you, well, uh, how do you see God uh, in these things? Then you might um, say, well, uh, here's the way I see him and you describe how you see God, then you open the Word of God and you begin to read what the Bible says about God. And you think, my goodness, that's not who God is at all. You see, the reason you and I need an anchor in our life is because it is natural and normal for us to drift. There's no such thing about somebody saying, well, I never drift. You stop reading the Word of God, you're going to drift. You stop praying, you're going to drift. You stop going to church, you're going to drift. Because you and I live, listen, we live in an age and a society, and we live in a time and an environment and an atmosphere and the pressure that is wicked and vile and sinful. And so, what happens is, when you're living in an unrighteous atmosphere, 
you, you will naturally drift toward unrighteousness unless you are anchored in something and anchored by something that keeps you from drifting. That's why I say to people, when you get up in the morning, you ought to open the Word of God. Oh, well, I don't necessarily need that. Yes, you do. We are living in a sinful, vile, sensual, selfish, ungodly atmosphere. And unless we're anchored in the Word of God, what's going to happen is we're going to find ourselves giving in. And so, what's the anchor? Well, what anchors you? When a storm hits you, what anchors you? Or do you just drift along with it? The Word of God is our anchor. Now, think about this for a moment. Storms are inevitable. Our anchor is immovable. Let's say it together. Storms are inevitable. Our anchor is immovable. That is, it doesn't move. It doesn't change. It anchors us solid to the rock of Christ. So, if that's true, then what we have to ask is this. Then what is this Bible? What is this, what is it about the Bible that can anchor me in times of great storms? And I can tell you, only by the grace of God and the anchor of the Word of God did He take me through some of these storms that I've been through in life. And many of you could testify the same thing. So, how is it, how is it the Bible anchors you? In other words, what is it, what is it about this book that does so? So, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put on the screen in just a moment, I'm going to put a definition of what this book, the Bible, is. And I want to look at it with you for a moment. I want you to look at it, and then I want you to write it down. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm so interested in the fact that you write it down, because if somebody says, well, what's the Bible anyway? I want you to have an intelligent, biblical, and a truthful answer. So, the Bible is the record. Listen, the Bible is the, it's the written record of God's unfolding revelation of Himself. Listen, through the spoken Word, in nature, in history, and ultimately through the coming of His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. So, let's think about that for a moment. The Bible is God's unfolding revelation of Himself. So, when somebody says to you, well, I don't believe that book because it's full of errors, just hand them your Bible and say, point them out. Just point them out. Secondly, think about this. Do we have a God who would give us a book that would mislead us? No. Jesus said, I am, the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is a God of truth. This book is the book of truth. And when people tell you that it's full of errors, first of all, they're speaking in ignorance, unbelief, and sin. You can mark it down. It is God's unfolding revelation of Himself. Listen, through the spoken Word, think about His prophets and those who spoke for Him in years past. Through nature, look how He worked in nature, whether it was the floods or whatever it might be. And in history, look how He worked through the nation of Israel and through the New Testament, the Apostle Paul and so forth. And finally, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If somebody says, well, what is God like? If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Here's what Jesus said, if you have seen Me, you've seen the Father. He was not talking about physically. He's talking about who He is, the person. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. I only do those things that I see the Father doing. You see, if you don't understand who God is, and this is His book, then it's not going to do you any good to read it if you don't understand who it is that wrote it. Now, somebody says, well, now, what about this God writing it? Here's how God wrote it. He chose specific men by the Holy Spirit and governed how those men heard Him, and governed the way they penned, they wrote, they recorded the message of God. As somebody says, yeah, but, but men can make mistakes. Let me ask you a question. Does God make mistakes? Oh, no, God doesn't make mistakes, but men do. Cannot God, who is supreme and sovereign, control the thinking of men that they don't make mistakes? You see, all that reasoning is the, is the result of sin in people's lives who want an excuse for not believing the Word of God. This is God's written record of His of, an unveiling of Himself. This is who God is. This is how He works. You want to know how God works? Start in the Old Testament and see how He worked. 
You want to see how God works? Get in the New Testament and see how He worked. What did He say? How did He work? How did He respond? How did He move? How did He change things? How, how did He work in the lives of people? If you don't understand who He is, then the anchor doesn't work. Because we're talking about a God who loves us enough to reveal Himself to us in a written record so that you and I would know who it is we are worshiping, how to worship Him, how to walk in obedience to Him, and how to stand firm in the midst of blowing winds of storm that come upon us in life. That's what the Word of God is. And that's why I want to put this up here so when somebody says to you, well, now, look, I, I know you believe this book and all about that, but what I want to know is uh, what is that Bible? It is the eternal Word of the eternal God given to us, listen, given to us as a guidebook so that we'll know who it is we're worshiping. Who is this God? Now, p people believe in all kind of gods. Listen, you ask somebody who has some other God, say, look, well, tell me about your God. You'd be surprised how little they can tell you. This is God's eternal Word. Now, we say, we use these terms, it's infallible, inerrant, and everlasting and eternal, which simply means it is God's book without error. Because this God of truth would not give us a book of error to be a guide. So, let me ask you a question. What is it about Jesus that some of you do not like? What is it about Jesus that you don't like? I'd, I'd like somebody to tell me, somebody who doesn't believe in Him. Well, just tell me what is it about Him you don't like? What did he do wrong? Zero. What is it about God you don't like? Well, if you have a false impression of who he is, then you may come up with something. But the God of the Bible, what is it about him you don't like? This is the eternal Word of God. God loved you and me enough to come in human flesh and walk among us to reveal to us who He is and what He's like. So, let's think about, just think about, for example, who He is. God is the Creator. He's the sovereign ruler of the universe, and He's the judge of all mankind. When you think about uh, what His attributes are, for example, He's a God of, shall we say, He's an he's the eternal God. He is holy. He is just. He's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. He's a God of mercy, faithfulness, and love. Now, what is it about God you don't like? What is it about God you change? The only people who would change anything about God are people who are living in sin and don't like God's viewpoint of their sin. Because think about this. You mean if He's a God of love, and goodness, and mercy, and kindness, and He's a God of justice. You don't want justice in your life? In other words, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, all these and many more attributes, unchanging. What is it about God you don't like? Or what is it about His words you don't like? What is it about Jesus you don't like? You see, how foolish to insist that the Bible is full of errors when God is holy. Listen, God could not be holy and give me a guidebook full of errors to mislead me. He cannot. And so, that's why we say, you know, if you want to anchor, here is the anchor. Now, here's the question, all right? If I understand what the Bible is, God's unfolding revelation of Himself, and understand who this God is that gave us the Word, how does the anchor help me when I'm in times of storm? Well, let's think about it for a moment. First of all, it comforts me greatly. I can remember some times at night when I'd get out of the bed in the middle of the night, get on my knees by the bed and open the Word of God and read a passage of Scripture because my heart was broken and because I could not handle the things that I was going through at that time uh, particularly. And so, I would come to this passage, Psalm 57. Psalm 57, if you read it, you'll underline it, mark it, and one of these days you'll put a date down by it and say, oh God, thank you for this. 
because I love what he says. Be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious to me. For my soul takes refuge in you. In the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until this destruction passes by. I will cry to God most high, the God who accomplishes all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me. God will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. I would read it and read it and read it and read it. And I love the part when he says, and in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. Now, uh, if I, I would simply say, who, whoever you are, um, you go through some storm in your life. One of the best places to start with the anchor is getting the Psalms. Because think about David, for example. Look at his life. Came up as a young man as a shepherd, killed Goliath, became a servant to Saul. Saul tried to kill him. Saul chased him for 20 years trying to kill him, sustained through all of that stormy life. And then uh, his uh, account with Bathsheba, and then his son betrayed him and started a revolution against him to take away the kingdom. In other words, he lived in one storm after the other. Look at the Psalms. The Psalms are the result of God comforting him and strengthening him, and he's so honest about them. And he talks about how his soul is in despair, and, and on the all known, 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 known he goes about what's going on in his life. It is a comfort. Now, think about this. The Word of God anchors our storm. Now, watch this. Because he is omniscient, all-knowing, he knows where I am in the storm. Because he's omnipresent, he's with me wherever I am in the storm. And because he's omnipotent, he has the power to bring me through the storm. That is the anchor. How do I know that's the anchor? Because that's who the Bible says he is, that he is all-knowing, that all presence is in his presence, and he's all-powerful. You remember when the disciples out on the ship had seen it was about to sink, and they were crying out? And what happens? Here comes Jesus walking on the water. Well, why was, why was he out walking on the water? He could have walked around the shore because in his omniscience, he knew where they were. And secondly, you remember what happens? When he comes on, uh, next thing you know, he's in the boat. He's with them. And the next thing that happens he just says, Can't, wouldn't you have loved to have heard this? Shh. And the waves get glassy and everything gets quiet. The awesome power of God. And I can tell you, God can quieten your stormy heart just like he quietened that storm. Amen. Comforts us. Well, uh, Look at the promises of God. This anchor is an anchor full of promises. When I think about it, how many awesome promises there are in the Word of God. He promises to give us peace, not when everything is going our way, but right in the midst of storms. And does He not say, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. What was He saying? He was saying that to men who were living in a storm that very night, and the storm was getting ready to turn into a tornado and a hurricane altogether. Jesus is going to be crucified the next day. What's he saying? Let not your heart be troubled. This is, listen, when he was here, that's the living anchor. He said it. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. What did he say? He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And on and on we could go of the things that he said. To do what? To comfort them, to assure them, promise after promise after promise. And no matter what you're going through, you can mark this down. There is a promise in the Word of God that will match what storm you're going through. This infinite God of ours, who gave us the revelation of Himself, because He's omniscient, he, watch this, He knew every single kind of storm that could ever come upon humanity 
from Adam and Eve in the garden to this present day until he comes back and wraps it all up. He knows all about all storms. So therefore, when he gave us his word, how many storms does his word cover? All of them. You cannot think of one he does not consider. The promises of His presence, the promise of His power, the promise of His provision in our life, whatever that need is. And sometimes the need is very simple. I just need to know you're here, Lord. I just need to be reminded that you understand why I feel what I feel. I just need to know, dear God, that you understand why I'm upset. I, you, you need to know why my faith is wavering. God, I just need to be comforted and assured. And when I think about people who live their entire life and very seldom ever open the Word of God, listen, how foolish. How foolish. Because you see, you're unprepared to live in this godless society. Would you go to work tomorrow morning undressed? No. Would you get in your car and start to work tomorrow morning with no fuel? No. I doubt if many of you would go to work without breakfast. All three of those things are essential. There's something more essential than that. If your heart's not prepared, your spirit's not prepared, you don't start the day with Him, then you have to start it in your own strength with yourself when you should be starting at Him. Why did God say to Joshua, Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord your God's with you wherever you go. And then here's what he said. Speaking of the law of Moses, and to us it would be the Bible, this book, shall we say, of the Word, of the Bible, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. You must purpose to do all that is written therein. That is, the situations and circumstances that come into your life, you, you find out, what did God say? What is He saying? Then I'll make your way prosperous. Then I'll make you a success. Now, think about it. That's the promise of God. Why do I want to get up in the morning and rush off down the expressway somewhere unprepared in my heart, in my spirit, in my soul? You never know what storm's coming. So what happens when they come? That is, how do you ride them out? In a ship at storm, in a storm, anchored, they ride it out. Do they get shook up? Yes. Beaten a little bit? Yes. But they ride it out, and the storm is over, and they sail on. It's the awesome power of this awesome God of ours. And the Bible says not only is He a comfort, but, but, but He's a compass to us. Listen to what He says in that 119th Psalm, 105th verse. My Word is a lamp to your feet, light to your path. He shows us the path, and then He, he, he listen, He gives us enough light to follow that path, step at a time. He's not going to show you all the way, but a step at a time. It's a promise. It's, it's a compass we have to guide us. And no sailing vessel would leave port without a compass or an anchor. No compass, you don't know where you are. And what does he say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean, lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. He will direct your path. He'll keep you in the channel. He'll keep you off the rocks. He'll keep you out of the shallow waters. He'll keep you in the right direction. That's the promise of the Word of God. And that's why this anchor needs to be a part of our life every single day, no matter what's going on. And I think one other way it helps us as an anchor is this. When I read in the Old Testament, for example, how God worked in the life of His servants, and for me personally, growing up, that was the most helpful thing about the Bible. When I'd read how God worked in, in, in Abraham's life, in Moses' life, in Joshua's life, in David's life, in Daniel's life, those men primarily, I learned an enormous amount of how God works. How did He work in their life? How would I know that without the anchor? How would I know that 
if I had no Bible, I wouldn't know it. And you see, many people make decisions just off the cuff. They don't ask the question, what is, listen, what is the wise thing to do? If I want to know what the wise thing to do is, I'm going to ask God. If I want to know what the wise thing is, I'm going to get in the Word of God and see how did God work in the past when His servants were in situations similar in some way or the other to what I'm going through in life, whatever storm I may be facing. How did God work then? And to me, coming along young, that was, that was the most reassuring thing to me. Well, if you would do that in Daniel's life, what would you do in my life? If, if you would do that if you would do that in David's life, what would you do in my life? If you do that in, in, uh, in Moses' life, what would you do in my life? Because you see, why, why did he give us all of that? He didn't give us all that just to give stories. And Paul says, what is in the Old Testament is for our good so that we will not repeat the same mistakes and suffer the same consequence. He makes it, he makes it clear in Corinthians. This is an anchor that is well worth what's going on. One other thing the anchor does is simply this. It helps me view, get God's viewpoint on what's happening to me. How, well, how would that happen? When I see how He allowed and sent storms in the past, I think, okay, how, how does it, is it, how, what similarities are there in this storm that I'm going through? How does God view these things? God doesn't view the storms in your li in life and my life as something that ha just happens. People say, well, that's just a happen. That's just an accident. In other words, are there just accidents in the life of men and women whose God is the Lord and who has said that He will govern and guide our life? Does that mean that everybody's going to live a long, healthy life? No. Because you and I have some bit of responsibility ourselves. And I was thinking about that this week, thinking about my father, for example, who died when I was nine months of age. Now, my mother never understood that. She passed away when she was about 84, and she was still asking me. She would say to me, you know, I still can't figure out why God took Charlie. She never could figure that out. And I tried to give her a little insight into it, but, you know, when you're her age, you believe what you believe, and that's about it. And so, I don't know that I ever convinced her of anything. But I can look back and say, well, that wasn't a mistake. And his disease that would be, would be curable today, God knew all about that. He could have let him live if he'd have chosen to, but he didn't. So why didn't he? Not having a father drove me to God very, very early in my life. Drove me to the Word of God. Drove me to see how God worked in the lives of Old Testament characters because I didn't have anybody else to tell me that. I can see how God used all of that to drive me to God early, to depend upon Him, to learn to trust Him no matter what. I think about the fact, for example, when I, uh, my first real job was delivering newspapers. I think, well, that wasn't the best job in the world, 5.30 in the morning, and you had to take a bag of papers on this side and a bag on this side, and you had to walk everywhere, none of this driving and tossing things. <laughs> you say, well, I could have had a better job. No, you know what? God knew that he had something in mind to get me up at 5 and 5.30 every morning, to be disciplined to dress myself. And in those days, it snowed at times and rain, sleet, hail, but you had to go no matter what was going on. You had no excuse for not delivering the paper. And so, he got me up every morning. Well, I was a little bit afraid of the dark. Well, how could God use that? I tell you exactly how. Because I'd get up before I walked out the door, start praying. I would pray all the way around my paper route because there was nothing much going on at 5 and 5 and 5.30 at 6 o'clock in Danville, Virginia. And so, I look back and see the things that could have been better. God knew that for me, it was best. So, sometimes what appears to be storms in our life may be a storm. But on the other hand, the question is, what's God doing in the storm? And you can mark this down. Whatever the storm is, He is at work. He's at work in the storm. And for somebody who's unwilling and, and unwilling to look in the Bible and look at all the promises here, He's up to something good in every single storm if we'll just trust Him. Now, it's one thing to have an anchor. 
But uh, as I said, no ship is going to leave port without an anchor and a compass. It's one thing to have an anchor, but you know what? Possessing it doesn't really make it work. For example, some people seem to have the idea if they take the Bible home and they put it on the table beside the bed at night and they're going to osmose it all night long. And somehow it's just, it's just, it's just going to get, it's not going to work. Or if you sleep on it, maybe you'll, you'll get it that way. You know how you get it? Here's how the anchor works. First of all, you got to read it. Secondly, you got to meditate on it. What is it saying? What's the message to me? Thirdly, you got to believe it. You've got to believe what it says. And fourthly, you've got to be willing to apply it to your life, not somebody else's life. And number five, you've got to be willing to obey it. Then the ankle works every single time. So the next time the storm hits you, remember what the anchor is, and that's the way you handle the anchor. It doesn't make any difference who you are, where you are, what you're going through. You may be someone who's never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You say, well, I don't get all that. Well, here's the reason you don't. Now, I understand. You see, as long as you live in sin, you'll never understand the truth of God. And until you're willing to acknowledge your sinfulness and the fact that God sent His Son Jesus into the world for the primary purpose of dying on the cross and paying your sin debt in full. Let me explain that. That means that the death of Jesus, who was the perfect Son of God, called the Lamb of God to be sacrificed as payment for your sin and mine, God placed the guilt of the whole world on His Son, crucified Him at the cross, and in so doing, made it possible for every person who believes in Him to be forgiven of their sin forever, their name written in the Lamb's book of life, eternally a child of God. It took Jesus to die, not someone else. Because you see, He's the only perfect person who's ever lived. And the whole Old Testament is a testimony to the fact that the Lamb that was slain a foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus. That lamb had to be absolutely spotless or it would not be an acceptable sacrifice. Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, went to the cross, died for your sins, and the moment you will to ask Him to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse your heart, surrender your life to Him, He's willing to forgive you. The Holy Spirit comes into your life to seal you as a child of God. That's a testimony of Scripture. And from that moment on, you can begin to grow as a Christian. And all the things that we've talked about can become a reality in your life. If you've never trusted Him as your Savior, let me just say this. You're sailing in dangerous waters. You don't have Him. You don't have a compass. You don't have the Word of God in your life. You don't have an anchor. And you think about this. You're just sailing around. There are lots of rocks, lots of shallows. And one of these days, you're going to shipwreck. I know that's hard for you to believe when you've got so much, and you're so healthy, and you're so, as you think, happy at this point. Ask any man who's ever piloted a ship, is it not foolish and suicide to go without an anchor and a compass and just go with the wind and the current? The current of today will lead you away from God. That's why we need the anchor to hold us steady. Amen. Amen. Father, we pray the Holy Spirit sink this message so deep that it cannot be lost. That every single person who hears it here and around the world will be able to identify with the need of Christ in the times of storm in their life. We know that you have the power Whatever language it's spoken in, you have the power to use it to bring about the salvation of multitudes of people, the assurance and confidence and comfort in millions of others. And that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 
If you've been blessed by today's program, please visit us at intouch.org.